Howdy. This video is on electrochemical reactions. Electrochemical reactions are really pretty common. Rust is formed by electrochemical reaction. Combustion is electrochemical reaction. Electrochemical reactions are also important in biology. And so electrochemical reactions are very, very common, and we should understand them. An electrochemical reaction just means that there's a transfer of electrons from one species to another species. After watching this video, you should be able to identify what's being reduced, what's being oxidized, the reducing agent, and the oxidizing agent. You should be able to determine the number of electrons being transferred during an electrochemical reaction, and you should be able to balance an electrochemical reaction. And so one way of remembering what oxidation is and what reduction is, is by using the mnemonic Leo goes Ger. Leo, lose electrons is oxidation, and Ger, gain electrons, is reduction. And so electrochemical reaction is also called a redox reaction, redox standing for reduction and oxidation. And so oxidation is the loss of electrons by species. And so if you lose electrons, you're losing a negative charge. And so the oxidation number increases. Remember oxidation number, oxidation state, same thing. It's just the charge an atom would have if the bonds in the molecule were purely ionic. Reduction is the gain of electrons, and so a decrease in oxidation number. The oxidizing agent is what causes the oxidation, and so the oxidizing agent is reduced. Reducing agent is what causes the reduction, and so the reducing agent is always oxidized. And so for electrochemical reaction, you're always going to have to have something being oxidized, which would be the reducing agent, and you always have something being reduced, which will be the oxidizing agent. And so this is a nice example of electrochemical reaction. Copper metal reacts spontaneously with a solution of silver nitrate. A coating of silver metal forms on the copper, while copper 2 plus ions, which are blue in water, are released into the solution. And so it's a really cool reaction if you have a solution with silver ions and you put a hunk of copper in it, what's going to happen is some of the copper metal will be converted to copper ions and some of the silver ions will be converted into silver metal. And so you can imagine that the silver ions wants the electrons more than the copper ions do. And so it is electrochemical reaction. So something is being oxidized. The copper is being oxidized. Each copper atom is losing two electrons as for forming a copper two plus. And so the copper is oxidized and it's the reducing agent. And then each silver ion is gaining a single electron. And so the silver ions are being reduced. The silver ions are the oxidizing agent. And so for electrochemical reactions, for redox reactions, the same thing. You have a transfer of electrons from one thing to another thing. And so in this example, we have electrons transferred from the copper to the silver ions. Now we can talk about it as a oxidation half reaction and reduction half reaction. The electrons in the two half reactions are the same. And so these two electrons are being lost by the copper are the same as these being two electrons being gained by the silver ions. And so the number of electrons in the oxidation step has to be equal to the number of electrons in the reduction step, which is equal to the number of electrons being transferred. And so we'd say that in this reaction, two electrons are being transferred. Now we can look at another uh, reaction. Here we have hydrogen ions, dichromate, nickel, metal, forming water, nickel ions, and um, chromium ions. And so if we want to figure out what's being oxidized, what's being reduced, we have to first determine the oxidation states of each element. And so that's usually the first step. And so nickel is going from zero. Nickel by itself has a zero oxidation state. Nickel two plus has a plus two oxidation state. Now the oxidation state is not affected by that coefficient in front. And so nickel here is zero, nickel here is a plus two. Now in terms of reduced, it's a little bit more complicated. We have the chromium in the dichromate. Remember, we can determine oxidation states by remembering the sum is 
equal to the next charge. So two times the chromium oxidation state plus seven times oxidation oxygen oxidation state equals minus two. And so minus two times seven is minus 14. Add 14 to both sides. Two times chromium is 12. And so chromium must be a plus six. And then here, chromium is a plus three. And so by looking at the oxidation states, we can see that the nickel is being oxidized. Again, the coefficient does not affect the oxidation state, but it does affect the total number of electrons. And so in the oxidation state, we have a transfer of two, a loss of two electrons. That's happening for three nickels. So three times two gives us six electrons in the oxidation step. Now for the reduction step, each chromium is going from a plus six to a plus three. So that's three electrons. We got two chromiums, two times three, also gives us six electrons. And so it's really important to remember that the number of electrons in the oxidation step has to, has to, has to be equal to the number of electrons in the reduction step, which has to, has to, has to be equal to the number of electrons being transferred. We can look at another example. And so here we have combustion of magnesium in oxygen. You know, is it a redox reaction? Again, is it an electrochemical reaction? And so to figure that out, all we have to do is look at oxidation states. And so if there's a change in oxidation state of any element, it has to be an electrochemical reaction. And so we see magnesium it's by itself, and so it has a zero oxidation state. Oxygen by itself, zero oxidation state. In magnesium oxide, the ox magnesium has a plus two, oxygen has a minus two. And so we see that magnesium and oxygen are both changing oxidation step states. And so that tells us that there it, this is a redox reaction. And so if you want to figure out what's being oxidized, remember lose electrons oxidation. And so magnesium is going from a zero to a plus two. And so it's losing electrons. And so magnesium is being oxidized. Now, what's being oxidized is the reducing agents causing reduction. So magnesium metal is also the reducing agent. Now, what's being reduced is gaining electrons. And so oxygen is going from a zero to a minus two. Remember, electrons are negatively charged. And so the oxygen is being reduced. And the oxidizing agent is what's being reduced. Now, how many electrons are being transferred? So if we look at the reduction step, we have two oxygen. Each oxygen are is gaining two electrons, two times two is four. That's just how easy chemistry is. If we look at the oxidation, each magnesium is losing two. We got two magnesium, two times two is four. The number of electrons in the oxidation half reaction has to equal the number of electrons in the reduction half reaction equals the number of electrons being transferred. And so we have four electrons being transferred. Now it's a kind of interesting reaction. You have a, a lot of things going on. You have the oxidation half reaction, reduction half reaction, um, the formation of the magnesium oxide. And we can actually take a look at the movie. Magnesium has an atomic number of 12 and is a strong but low density metal. Magnesium metal is highly reactive. When ignited, magnesium metal burns in air to form a mixture of magnesium oxide and magnesium nitride. The light emitted is of blinding intensity. We used a camera with charged coupling devices, or chips, instead of tubes, to obtain these images. The light would have burned an ordinary pickup tube and could easily damage a human eye. So this is reactions based on the transfer of electrons. It's kind of cool. We're going from a springy metal. The oxide is a brittle white solid in contrast to the springy magnesium metal. To a brittle white solid. And again, it's based on just a transfer of electrons. Interesting question that we could ask ourselves is, will magnesium burn in CO2 gas? Now, often people think that for combustion, you need oxygen. But that's not the case. You know, if you think about combustion as a redox reaction, now the question happens, you know, can magnesium be oxidized in CO2? Or can magnesium reduce CO2? And so if we look at the potentials, we'd actually see that magnesium 
can cause a reduction of the CO2. Now we can see a demonstration of this. This is really kind of cool. This white block here is solid CO2, so it's dry ice. And they're going to put magnesium in the middle and they'll light it. And then they'll cover it with another block of dry ice. Now initially the magnesium will be burning the oxygen. And then you'll see the flame die out a little bit when all the oxygen's gone. And then the magnesium will start reacting with the CO2 and you'll see it actually is pretty bright. bright. Magnesium is placed in a cavity in a block of dry ice. The magnesium is ignited. and covered with another block of dry ice. Despite the absence of air, the magnesium continues to glow due to its reaction with carbon dioxide. Because of this reaction, carbon dioxide cannot be used to extinguish magnesium fires. The reaction products are white magnesium oxide and black carbon. And so magnesium is a very good reducing agent and that's why it's able to reduce the CO2. And so we can look at another example. Is this a redox reaction? And again, if we want to know that the answer to that, we have to look at the oxidation states. And so whenever there's a different, a change oxidation state of an element, it has to be a redox reaction. And so we see the aluminum is going from a zero to a plus three. And so that tells us that this is a redox reaction. It's actually a fairly famous redox reaction. It's, it's a thermite called the thermite reaction. Now to figure out what's being oxidized, we see that aluminum's from a zero to a plus three, and so it's losing electrons. Again, Leo goes Ger, lose electrons is oxidation, and so the aluminum metal is being oxidized. The reduce the thing being oxidized is what's causing reduction, and so aluminum metal is also a reducing agent. Now, if we look at what's being reduced, notice that the iron's going from a plus three to a zero, and so it's gaining three electrons. Each iron is gaining three electrons. And so the iron is being reduced. And so the iron is being the oxidizing agent. Now to determine the number of electrons being transferred, we can look at, we should look at both the oxidation step and the reduction step. And so for the oxidation step, we saw each aluminum is losing three. We got two aluminum, two times three is six. For the reduction step, each iron is gaining three. We got two iron, two times three is six. And so please remember the number of electrons in the oxidation step equals the number of electrons reduction step equals the number of electrons being transferred. Chemical reactions are exothermic, but none quite like the thermite reaction. Here we have a piece of filter paper which we're going to fold into a cone. We're going to place a mixture of aluminum and iron oxide into the cone. We're also going to add some thermite starting mixture. This is a powdered material which helps the oxidation reaction. We're going to place that then in a hole in this container of sand. I'm then going to place a piece of magnesium ribbon down into the mixture and move the explosion shield into place before we light the magnesium fuse. Now we can take a look at the molten metal by carefully lifting it out of the sand. This white hot iron is encased in a crucible of glass that has been made by melting the sand. 
you can see some of the liquid metal as it dripped out of the glass. So it's a really exothermic reaction. And again, it's based on a transfer of electrons. And so the aluminum's losing electrons and the iron's gaining those electrons. There's been speculation that one reason that the Hindenburg went up so quickly was that there was an iron oxide coating on the outside and aluminum trusses. And so that reaction started to occur and caused the Hindenburg to explode so, so quickly. So here we have another reaction. Again, is it a redox reaction? So we look at the oxidation states. And so as long as there's a change in oxidation states, it means there has to be a redox reaction. And so the copper is losing an electron. It's going from a zero to plus one. Each oxygen is gaining two electrons, zero to minus two. And so we have a change in oxidation states. And so it has to be a redox reaction. Leo goes GER, lose electrons oxidation. And so the copper is losing an electron. And so it's being oxidized. So that means it's the reducing agent. The oxygen is gaining two electrons, each oxygen. And so it's being reduced. And so it's the oxidizing agent. And so if we look at the reduction step, we have each oxygen is gaining two. We've got two oxygen, two times two is four. For the oxidation step, we have each copper is losing one. We got four coppers, four times one is four. And so the number of electrons in the oxidation step equals the number of electrons in reduction step equals the number of electrons um, being transferred. And so really kind of cool reaction. You have copper plus oxygen forming the copper oxide. And so the um, oxygen is a pretty good oxidizing agent. Hydrogen is a pretty good reducing agent. And so once we form the copper oxide, we can actually reduce it back to copper by using the hydrogen, by using hydrogen gas. A piece of copper is supported over a burner and is heated. The copper begins to react more rapidly with oxygen from the air, and a darker color can be seen on the surface of the copper. This is similar to the color that forms on copper cookware when it is used in a kitchen. A few seconds later, the copper has become dark. It has reacted with oxygen in the air. The burner flame is turned out and an inverted funnel with hydrogen gas blowing out of it is placed over the copper. The hydrogen gas is a reducing agent. It reduces the copper oxide on the surface of the copper and causes pure copper to be formed again. The dark color disappears, leaving a pure copper color. Oxidation and reduction of the copper can be repeated several times by removing and replacing the funnel until the metal cools and the reactions slow down. So really kind of cool, you know, the oxygen is a good oxidizing agent, so it can oxidize the copper to copper oxide. Hydrogen is a good reducing agent, and so it could reduce the copper oxide back to the copper metal. And so redox reactions sometimes involve, well, always involve the transfer of electrons. Sometimes you can also have electric voltage, but not always. And so I've mentioned before that rust is just a redox reaction. And so you have iron plus oxygen plus water forming um, iron ions and hydroxide. When metallic iron is exposed to water and oxygen, it undergoes a product-favored redox reaction. The oxidation of iron produces Fe2 plus ion and releases electrons. The iron itself conducts these free electrons to the site of the reduction, where the availability of electrons allows gaseous oxygen to react with liquid water to produce hydroxide ion. Upon further contact with gaseous oxygen, the ions of iron and hydroxide react to produce iron hydroxide, which is visible as rust. And so we can use this as an example of how to balance a redox reaction. And so there's a few steps involved. And again, one of the key things is to make sure that the number of electrons in the oxidation half reaction 
is equal to the number of electrons in reduction half reaction. And so balancing a redox reaction, first what we want to do is separate out the two half reactions, the oxidation half reaction and the reduction half reaction. And we do that by writing down the oxidation states for all the atoms. Right, iron is by itself, so it has oxidation state of zero. Oxygen by itself, no charge, oxidation state is zero. Um, hydrogen in water is plus one. Oxygen is minus two. Iron with a plus two charge is a plus two oxidation state. Oxygen minus two, hydrogen plus one. And so we notice that the iron is being oxidized. And so that means the oxygen must be being reduced because it's going from a zero to a minus two. So the first step is to break your reaction into oxidation and reduction half reactions. Now the second step is to balance, uh, mass balance each half reaction. All right, so for the oxidation half reaction, we have iron and iron. It's already mass balanced, so we don't have to do anything. For the reduction, we had oxygen and hydroxide, and it wasn't mass balanced. And so if we add four water molecules, now we have four hydrogens. We have two, four oxygens. And so that gives us four hydroxyl groups. And so for reactions in acidic solution, you can add hydrogen ions or water to either side. For reactions in the basic solution, you can add hydroxide ions or water to either side. And so we assume that we were in a basic solution. Now the third step is to balance each half reaction charge by adding electrons. And so if we notice that in our oxidation half reaction, we have a char charge neutral and a plus two. Now we need both sides to have the same charge. They do not have to be zero, but they do have to be the same. And we only can add electrons. And so if we add two electrons to the product side, then we actually have neutral and neutral. They have to again be the same, don't have to be neutral. For the reduction half reaction, we have neutral as reactants, no charge, no net charge. In the products, we have a minus four. And so that means we're going to have to add four electrons to the reactant side. And so now we have a minus four charge reactants, minus four charge for the products. And then the fourth step is making sure that the oxidation reduction half reactions have the same number of electrons. And so we had two electrons in our oxidation step and half reaction and four in our reduction half reaction. And so we need to multiply the oxidation half reaction times two. So we multiply everything times two. So two iron goes to two iron two plus, plus four electrons. Now we have the same number of electrons in both uh, half reactions. And then the fifth step, the last step, is we add our two half reactions. Remember that things common, common on both sides cancel, and so the electrons actually end up canceling, and now we have our balanced uh, electrochemical reaction. But again, it's very important that you make sure that the number of electrons in the oxidation half reaction equals the number of electrons in the reduction half reaction. And so for balancing reaction, we use five steps. We first separate out the reaction into half reactions. We mass balance each half reaction. We charge balance each half reaction by adding electrons. Multiply the half reactions if needed to make sure that each half reaction has the same number of electrons. And then we add our two half reactions. And so I think I've shown you that electrochemical reactions are common. Rust is formed by electrochemical reaction. Combustion is electrochemical reactions. Electrochemical reactions are also important in biology. Electrochemical reactions are also called redox reactions, and they also just involve the transfer of electron from one compound to another compound. We can tell that electric uh, reaction is electrochemical reaction because the oxidation state of an element is going to change. When balancing electrochemical reactions, we have to make sure that the number of electrons in the oxidation half reaction has to be the same as the number of electrons in the reduction half reaction. I hope that was helpful.